would almost certainly have died of hypothermia by now. At the town of Rikuzen Takata, rescue workers hunt for survivors and discover the dead. When they find a body, they put a large stick in the ground with a flag attached to it so that it can be recovered later. It's a fairly gruesome and sad task. In fact, they're not just collecting bodies, they're also collecting personal mementos as well, which they find, um, like this. I'm afraid what we have here is more bodies waiting to be taken away. Even now, the tsunami was not finished with Japan. Back at the Fukushima power plant, what started as a failed generator was fast becoming the biggest nuclear crisis since Chernobyl. We'll keep the windows closed and uh, I'll put on a mask. Scientists have already gathered more data from Japan's earthquake and tsunami than from any other disaster in history. As Professor Roger Billum returns to Tokyo from his aerial survey, the city's vulnerability becomes all too clear. There are 30 million people within about two meters of sea level and uh, a tsunami here, of course, would be absolutely devastating. Suddenly, a problem. We had a big earthquake just now, so... Really? Yeah. We've just learned from the ground that there was an earthquake that damaged the heli heliport. They're checking for damage right now. We don't know how big the earthquake was, but it was obviously a, a very uh, a nearby aftershock. A massive aftershock has hit Tokyo. Magnitude 6.2. In the week that followed the main quake, there were over 500 aftershocks along the fault. This is the actual data from seismometers around Japan. The larger the circle, the bigger the aftershock. The shaking is now stopped, so I'll just continue landing. Finally, Billum's helicopter is given the all clear to land. Even at the heliport in Tokyo, the damage is plain to see. I've noticed that the tarmac here, which should be beautifully dark everywhere, in fact stained white in places, and you can see that in fact sand has come out of this crack, and there's another one over there, another one over there. We're very close to the shoreline, and the lurching motion of the uh, ground during the earthquake has caused the subsurface liquefied sands to come belching out on the top. Precisely the same phenomenon, liquefaction, that was filmed during the earthquake. And over here is an old mud volcano. Um, uh, old, it's about three days old. You can see how the mud came pouring out of the top there. So look, we're 200 miles from the epicenter here, and here's a crack in uh, uh, the heliport landing area. It, it continues all the way along here. You can actually see down about uh, three feet in places. Uh, splits into two here. This goes over here. You can see an offset in the... Um, in this uh, trim around the, uh, the tarmac. As the Earth's crust shattered during the main quake, new stresses spread along the fault. Relieve the pressure in one place, and it builds up elsewhere, triggering aftershocks. What you're seeing here is how those aftershocks happened over a period of about a week after the main shock. And that orange region, delineated by those orange dots, uh, essentially gives you a feeling for the uh, area of the fault uh, along the plate boundary that ruptured in this event. Every aftershock takes its toll on an already frightened population.
journalist Callum McRae has been moved by the plight of the people here. In the regional capital of Sendai, the temporary shelters are full. But in a darkened, ravaged city, it seems one person at least is trying to cling to normality. We're in Sendai, three or four hundred metres from the shorefront, in a, in a scene of apocalyptic chaos. Uh, it's cold, it's dark, there's no power anywhere. And yet, up there, in that 